My name is Brian Gerard, and I serve on staff at First Christian Church of Louisville, Kentucky, and I want to welcome you uh, into this sacred hour of worship. Uh, we recorded this worship service last Thursday, and at the time of our recording, we still don't know, we still didn't know at that time, the results of the election. I'm hoping we know by the time you see this in worship this weekend, but right now we don't know. And there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of strong emotions and feelings, and we're carrying those into worship today. When, when I find myself in a place where I need to be grounded, where I start to feel overwhelmed by the circumstances around me, and I can't tell if things are going to go my way or go a different way, and sometimes my anxieties start to get the best of me, and I need to be rooted in my faith, there is a passage that I go to more than any other passage in Scripture and it's a passage that doesn't necessarily provide answers, but it provides hope. And I know that I've read it many times when we've faced crises together as a church over the course of the last 18 years, but I want to read it again. It comes to the Apostle Paul in the 8th chapter of Romans. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The God who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will that God not with him also bring us everything else? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors in the one who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God that is found in Jesus Christ. And, and while this may be a time of worry and concern, and we're not exactly sure how it's played out, certainly when I'm saying this, but, but even in the days and weeks to come, as a people of faith, our ultimate hope is found in a God that never abandons us, walks with us always, gives us things that no earthly ruler or principality can, and there is nothing Nothing, nothing that will ever separate you from God's love that's found in Jesus Christ. I need to hear those words and I need to be reminded of them. As we continue with worship this morning and we enter into our time of prayer, I'm, I'm going to step out of the way because I don't want to assume what you need to pray for. And, and really what you may need to pray for may change between when I'm saying these words and you're praying them uh, this weekend or, or whenever you join with us in worship. So I'm just going to step out of the way. I'm going to start this. I'm going to step out of the way and then I'm going to lead us in that prayer that Jesus taught us, uh, the one that, that we take to God anytime, anywhere to sum up the needs that we have. Let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, as we enter into this sacred time of prayer, I ask that you would just hear the prayers that are written on all of our hearts in this time of silence. Loving God, receive all of these prayers that we've offered to you. Remind us of your presence with us as we offer to you the words your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
My name is Patty Rankin. <clears throat> when I was a child of grade school age, uh, in Sunday school, we memorized the 100th Psalm. It's a simple invitation to come to God in faith and joy. I'd like to read it to you now. <clears throat> Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into Lord's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is God that made us, and we belong to God. We're God's people and the sheep of our Lord. Enter the gates with thanksgiving and the courts of God with praise. Give thanks to God and bless God's name, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever, and God's faithfulness to all generations. We are to come and worship God humbly and joyfully, acknowledging that God is in charge and trusting God with our lives. For God made us, and we belong to God. This is a simple, reassuring message for this troubled time. In this same vein, everything we have belongs to God and has been given to us by God to help others in our world. As we gather in this virtual worship space, May gratefulness fill our hearts. Give your gifts to God and God's church. As the psalm says, making a joyful noise. As Charlotte Tharp reminded us last week, give with joy. According to 2 Corinthians, the churches in ancient Macedonia were facing a crisis. We don't know exactly what the crisis was, but in his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul describes it as a severe affliction that is causing those churches and the people in that region to experience extreme poverty. The response of the Macedonians, however, was one of incredible faith and one that brought hope to their church and to all those in the region surrounding them. What did they do? In spite of their extreme poverty, they came together and gathered their resources, and they presented Paul, who was representing the larger church, they presented Paul with a financial gift to support the ministries of the church, to take care of people who were in need, beyond just their own need. And the incredible thing is that this gift was so large that Paul's first response was to try to refuse it. He said to them, look, this is way beyond your means. But the people of Macedonia insisted. They wanted to help other people out in spite of their situation. The, the letter tells us that they begged Paul, take our gift. We want to be a part of this solution. I love that the Macedonians in their time of extreme poverty and crisis didn't retreat in fear, that they, that they didn't dig into a theology of scarcity, one that says there just isn't enough and I've got to take care of me and mine and you are on your own. No, that was not their response. Their response was to lean into and believe in the theology of abundance that in God's reign there is enough for everyone if only everyone will respond in faith. And, and that's what the Macedonian church did. 
They responded in faith, and in so doing, they lived out their faith, and they lived into the hope of God's promise that that when you take care of each other, you can get through crises and get to the other side. This model of faith was, was so impactful that as Paul is telling the church in Corinth about it, he likens it to the actions of Jesus Christ. This is what he said. This is the comparison. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Now, it's important to note, and I know you know this, when Paul was talking about the riches of Christ, he wasn't talking about material possessions. He wasn't talking about money or finances. He was talking about the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. That Jesus could have chosen how to rule any way Jesus wanted to choose, any way Jesus wanted to rule. But instead of using his position as one of power and might, Jesus came into the world humbly in the form of a human. And his entire ministry was based on the ministry of grace reconciliation, gentleness and care, forgiveness and mercy and reaching out and providing for others even even when it comes at great sacrifice to yourself. Jesus lowered himself in order that we may be lifted up as heirs of Christ in the grace of God. The, the, The actions of the Macedonians They they lowered themselves. They offered themselves in sacrificial service to others so that they might find themselves, that those that others may find themselves lifted up. This is at the heart of our gospel. This is the heart of what it means to be Christian. That when we have the opportunity to serve, we leverage whatever power, whatever resources we have to serve in order to make the world a better place for all of God's children. It's at the heart of who we are as a people of faith. It was certainly at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and it's something that's so important for us always to keep in mind. One of the things we need to note when we read any letters in the New Testament, any letters throughout Scripture for that matter, is we're only seeing one side of the dialogue. These communications were happening in two directions. So what we see is only, in this example, we see a second letter being written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. But it's being written in response to certain questions, certain concerns, certain situations. And while it speaks to a broader audience, certainly it was meant first for that church. We don't see the other side of the correspondence. So in order to understand the letter, you kind of got to read between the lines. And as you read between the lines in this letter, what what you begin to see is a picture that, uh, uh, that while the Macedonian church was in crisis... The churches in Corinth were not. Things there seemed to be okay. But even though things there were okay, they were not living into their faith when it came to serving others, when it came to being generous with what they had. And so Paul was writing to address that. Let's look at some more of what he said. And in this matter, I'm giving my advice. It is appropriate... For you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. So what what, what it looks like is happening here is that at some point last year, the Corinthian church and the people there recognized the need to contribute to help uh, those who are in crisis, to help the church do its ministry beyond just Corinth. And they got excited about it. They were eager about it. And they all wanted to be a part of it. The problem, however, is that eagerness didn't flow into action. It didn't flow into follow-up. They made that promise, but they didn't carry it out. They, They filled out a pledge card, but they didn't write the check. And so what Paul is doing here is he's, he's calling them to account. He's saying, look, you, you made this promise, you made this offer, and, and now you're pulling back from it, and you're not living into it. And, and when it comes to living into our Christian faith, um, it's, not, it's not simply that, that it's the thought that counts. It's got to be more than that. 
The thought's got to be put into action in order to allow God's work to be done on earth. You make a promise and you live into your faith by living out your faith. And so Paul's pressing on them a little bit saying, look, you made a promise. Now you've got to live into it. Um, now, you know, I think this is part, in part while he's tell, why he's telling them the Macedonian story. I mean, what he's doing is he's showing them an extreme example of people who were in poverty who were stepping up to help others. This is a gut check for people who weren't in crisis, saying, hey, if, that folk, if those folks can do it, I think you could probably do it too. Come on, guys, it's time to step up your game, he's telling the church there. Um, now, I do want to focus a little bit uh, on how this passage ends. You'll notice that he says you need to complete this according to your means. Now, I think this is really interesting. Uh, first, because he tells a story of people, of the Macedonian churches giving beyond their means. And he tried to correct that a little bit and tamp that down, but they wanted to do it anyway. A, a wonderful and beneficial model of faith. And, and, and I certainly uh, celebrate that and lift that up. At the same time, Paul is very clear about this. We're not called to give beyond our means. That can happen, and there are certain occasions where we need to make that kind of sacrifice. But for the most part, we're called to give according to our means, within our means. And the struggle for the Corinthian church is that they were giving below their means. And Paul's wanting them to pick it up and give according to their means. He's telling them, look, you don't have to give beyond your means, but you got to give to your means. That's, that's the only way all of this is going to work. Um, so he's, he's going to continue uh, to talk with them and, and to try to encourage them uh, to live into that call. But they've got some concerns. And, and Paul's going to have to address those concerns. And, and I'm going to share with you the next portion of this letter, and then we'll kind of talk about it a little bit as to what, what he's saying to them. First thing he says is, I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you. But it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need. So that in their abundance, they may be there, that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had, to, who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. All right, let, let, let's unpack this just a little bit. Again, remember, Paul is responding to a specific concern. This is one side of a correspondence. It appears that the people in Corinth were worried that, 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 that this giving that they were being asked to do to help others was perhaps unfair, that there was a burden that was being placed on them to make sacrifices to take care of other people. And, and I don't think it's that the Corinthian church didn't want to help other people. They just wanted to make sure that they weren't being taken advantage of. They wanted to make sure that they weren't sacrificing of what they had, that they weren't making themselves a little bit more vulnerable for the sake of others in a way that was allowing others to take advantage of them. They just wanted it to be fair. They wanted it to be on the up and up. They were just a little bit concerned about that. And, and I think that's a legitimate concern. And so Paul's response is to talk with them about that word fairness. And, and what does fairness mean when it comes to our needs and our possessions, our needs versus our wants, uh, being in a place of abundance and being in a place of poverty and affliction? What, what, what does that mean? So what Paul does is, is he models out fairness in a different way. He says that, look, fairness in the kingdom of God is, is a little bit different. Because in the kingdom of God, there is this um, economy, there's this structure where all of God's children have what they need. It doesn't mean that some people don't have more and some people don't have less. But, but when you look at Scripture, when you look at the theology of Scripture, from beginning to end, it is set up in such a way that every single child of God has what they need. They, they've got enough to live. Nobody has too much and nobody has too little. Now, in order for that to happen in, in, in reality, what it means is that people have to give, and they have to give according to their means, which means that to, to whom much has been given, much is required, much is expected, and to whom little has been given, a little bit less is expected, but we're all in this together. And so, so Paul is trying to pull them into this new and different reality. And, and it's interesting because this is hard. Living into that kind of reality takes trust and faith not only in God. It takes trust and faith in each other. 
Because if I follow this command and I give of myself so that you will be okay in your time of need, but then when you are in a period where you have abundance and I am in need, if you don't return that favor, then I'm left high and dry, right? And that, I think that's what the Corinthian church was worried about. You know, if we give now, we, we make ourselves a little bit more vulnerable. Are they going to do the same? Because if they don't, then, then we're left high and dry. And Paul's like, look, they've done more than that. They're trusting this process. We need, we need you to trust this process. And so we, we all come together by God's call, by faith in God and faith in one another, and we take care of each other. And that, that's hard. Well, I, I get it. I, I, I get how hard this is. We, we know that we're called to care for one another, but, but you know, I think like the Corinthians, when, when, when we're about giving of our resources to other people so that they're okay, we want it to be fair, right? We, we want it to be on the up and up. We don't want people to just be taking advantage of us. We, we've worked hard for what we have, and, and we know that our primary responsibilities are to take care of ourselves and our families. We, we get that, um, but what Paul is saying is that we, we, we've got to remember that when it comes to what our family is, every single child of God is a member of our family. And when one child of God suffers, we all suffer. And so when it, when it comes to getting through particularly times of crises, we got to come together. we got to trust in and believe in God's promise that, that as a whole body of Christ, supporting one another according to our means, we get to that other side. And when we live in that way, we bring a hope into the world that is just incredible. We live in hope, and we provide people with the opportunity to live with hope. I'm going to give you a very specific example of that. Our partner ministry in northeastern Jefferson County for providing benevolent services to those in need is Eastern Area Community Ministries. They've got a story to share about someone who is in need and how they helped out. And it is a story that is filled with hope. Hello, good afternoon. And my name is Kevin Benitez. I'm from Venezuela, saying to my wife and my two daughters. Uh, my wife and I worked in Venezuela for maybe 14 years, almost 15. Uh, she and I were professors in the university. Uh, we teach computer in the engineering area. Our life in Venezuela, no, no, no were bad, was good. We had a work, a good job, good money, or apartment, or car, regular life, or a study. But in the moment when I leave, you lost all. We lost all. We arrived to the United States just with four suitcases. One for my wife, one for me, one for each of my daughters. The first day, when it comes to the ACN, I know to Patty Robles, you know, okay, speak Spanish, this is so good. This is my first language. Some days in our life in the United States, the first days, sorry. Uh, we don't have food to eat. It's difficult. Sometimes you can work because our situation, our situation is for asylum, political asylum. But in the moment when Patty said me, don't worry, of name the EACN, don't worry, this is food. Take the food, take the cloth for you, daughter. take diapers, take shampoo. You know, personal care. You say, wow, this is good. Because it's the moment when you more need this product. 
this is her blessing. Because when you have good knowledge about what is the best way for managing your money, you can grow. Hey, give me, give me a lot of paper about that. I need to learn. But this is so good. Never in my life, never in my life, in my life, I imagine live here, learn English, teach English, but right now, <laughs> right now, my wife and I are teacher in Newcomer Academy. It's a special school for the newcomers for different countries around the world that come to the United States to give a new life, new language, for learn a new culture. But, okay, if God decide this way, I respect uh, his decision. I don't know how you watch that and not come away with a tremendous sense of hope. Kevin and his family were in a severe crisis. They were living into an experience of extreme poverty. And you can tell as he tells the story, there's a tremendous sense of hopelessness and fear and worry in the midst of that. But then they found Eastern Area Community Ministries. And they were welcomed there by someone who spoke a common language with them. And they began to take classes and they got some food and they got personal care items like, like those we're collecting right now to offer EACM so that they can help people like Kevin and his family. And as they began to receive those services from EACM, uh, they began to find hope and they began to find a direction and they began to believe that they were going to be okay. You can see his entire countenance change as he tells that story. It's just so powerful. Kevin is not the only story of hope that comes out of that partner agency for us. But every one of those stories that comes out of that, uh, out of that uh, ministry that they provide is funded by churches like ours, by other churches in this community, by individuals like you, living into the theology that we're talking about today that Paul writes about in this letter to the Corinthians. That we are called by God to faithfully support one another by giving within our means, by giving in our means to those around us so that everyone has what they need to make it. So, so first, let me just say thank you. Thank you for your generosity that makes it possible for our church and our partner agencies to make a difference in the lives of people like Kevin to give them hope in the midst of their fear and anxiety and worries. We do that. We make that happen. And I believe it is a concrete expression of the grace of God in the midst of a time of crisis and struggle. It, it, it's putting flesh on God's love. It's amazing. You're doing that. that. That's the difference that our gifts make. But our work isn't done. And there may be even some more critical work for us in the months and particularly in the year ahead. And so I'm just clear about it. We need your help. I mean, we're going to continue to need that help. And right now we are in the midst of planning our budgetary year uh, for 2021, and we really need you to fill out your um, estimate of giving card. You can find it if you're watching online. It's listed below the sermon. Uh, it's on the sermon page. It's in our app. It's on our website. It's on our give page. We put it in as many places as you can. It won't take long for you to fill it out. But we, everything we do from our support to EACM to what we do on site, managing worship and all those things, all that is dependent upon those promises that you make. My hope is that you're like the Corinthian church and you're real eager about making those promises. But my hope is also that you're like the Macedonian church and that you follow through with your promises and that you believe in the hope that they're going to provide the world around us. As for me, when I think about what we do as a church and what we think about what we, and as I think about what we do as individuals and I see it played out in, in stories like Kevin's, it makes it a lot easier for me to live into faith, to live with hope, and to give with joy. Amen.
just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you Just as you are Oh, and hear, hear the Spirit Hear it call Come, just as you are Come and see Oh, come receive Come and live forever Life everlasting Oh, and strength Strength for today Come and taste The living water My friend and mentor, Reverend Rick Loader, has always given me the best advice when I call him with questions or frustrations about ministry. Often, I will call him on the verge of giving up or so hurt or disappointed by people. Rick's advice has always been the same. He reminds me that it is my job, well, it is my calling to love people, to love them where they are, to love as God has loved, to look at others and see Jesus in them. There are days that I don't want to do this. There are days that this is the hardest thing imaginable to do. But God calls us to love. The world needs more love. As we gather at this table, let us hear Rick's words again. These advice, this advice that he gives me. Choose love. Look at people and love them. Let's continue to share love and be reminded of that love here at this table. The most amazing example of love gathered with his community, knowing the hurt and betrayal that was to come, Jesus focused on love. He took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and shared it with those who had gathered with him and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we break the bread and drink the cup, we are recalling God's presence among us. We are recalling the love that God has shown each of us. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the words we hear, for the bread we taste, for the cup we drink. Metaphor and mystery healing and haste, the gratitude of our spirits, and a blessing on our lives. All this we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. The bread of life and the cup of salvation for you. During our invitation to discipleship, I always want to include asking if there are those who would like to join our church, but I think it's also important to ask questions to give us things to think about during this time. So it's kind of like an invitation to be a better disciple. Today, my invitation to be a better disciple is through reconciliation. And I think I want to do this through prayer. So let us pray together. Loving God, bring us together. Show us the path to reconciliation. Where hasty words have hurt, bring us together in peace to give and accept apologies. Bring us together Show us a path to reconciliation where the sting of, reje of rejection has caused hard feelings. Bring us together with friendship to make a fresh start. Bring us together, show us the path to reconciliation where life has been smooth sailing for one and awful for another, bring us together to listen to the stories, to support those who have experienced a harder life. Bring us together, show us a path to reconciliation where division has split the communities. Bring us together to faith, to pray, to work together. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been invited to join us in a path of reconciliation. And if you want to be part of this community, we ask that you join us and work with us on our path towards reconciliation. This is your opportunity if you want to become part of our faith community, then let us know. Text us, email us, call us. We are still church. We are still community. We have an amazing staff and elders, Stephen ministers, who want to hear your story and pray with you. So as we go this day... Let us leave prepared to act with Christ, alert for those situations that are difficult, whose outlook is bleak, ready to stand by the outcast, prepared to stay the course for the one suffering with resources of empathy, patience, and hope. Amen.